Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute of History, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwood's Stores, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with our Will Rogers medallion-winning author-historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. It's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the Oklahomans we remember. John J. Dwyer, who was Oklahoma's favorite son? What's his story? Well, Gwen, if ever a vote were taken to determine the most beloved Oklahoman, surely it would be William Penn Adair Will Rogers. Five sixteenths Cherokee and the rest Scottish, his life began near Ulaga in the Cherokee country of Old Indian Territory, little more than a decade after the war between the states. His father, Clem Rogers, was a cowboy, rancher, judge, entrepreneur, member of the Oklahoma State Constitutional Convention, and one of Confederate General Stan Wadey's greatest cavalry scouts in the hard-riding Cherokee Mounted Rifles. Will hailed from a family steeped in the tragic Cherokee Tribal Civil War as well. Followers of the Majority Principal Chief John Ross Party murdered Will's Treaty Party grandfather, Clem's father, in 1842. Cherokee Chief and Confederate General Wadey had long been a leader of the Treaty Party. Treaty Party supporters like Clem strongly supported the Confederacy. After Kansas Jayhawker Union Raiders stole all Clem's stock early in the war, he refugeed his family south from his ranch, which lay only 60 miles from pro-federal Kansas. His daughter Elizabeth perished during the arduous trek, and this was actually before Will was born. Meanwhile, though, handsome, fair-haired, blue-eyed, square-jawed, and determined like his father, Will, who was born in 1879, had a turbulent relationship with Clem, as the latter also had with his own father. Here's a quote from Clem about Will. Willie ain't never going to amount to nothing. All he's good for is to buy up these expensive hosses and fool around roping contests. Ugh, he's fixing to ruin us. Do you know that? That was father speaking of son. Also like Clem, and maybe this is one of those acorns not falling far from the tree, though Will possessed great intelligence, he despised organized school. Can I hear an amen of that from any of our listeners? This coupled with a sense of adventure and his real-life cowboy spirit chafing against his father's rough-hewn, iron-fisted manner conspired to drive Will permanently out of his home and out on his own by age 20. Well, as a young man, he traveled as far away as Australia and South Africa to practice trick roping and breaking horses. He later took his talents to the New York City stage. How he wound up there, I, I don't recall, but mixed with a natural-born talent for comedy, and despite his own father's failure to recognize the potential of his unique personal abilities, he gained renown with, of all groups, the world-famed Zigfield Follies doing his roping tricks. His first widespread notice actually occurred during a show in the original Madison Square Garden. When a wild steer broke loose into the large crowd, Will spontaneously roped and corralled him in front of everyone to the roaring applause of the thousands watching and newspaper readers from coast to coast. Will he pursued Arkansas native Betty Blake for years during this early 1900s era before winning her hand. And that only occurred, according to Rogers biographer Ben Yagoda, when Will decided to move back to the new state of Oklahoma near Claremore, from the East, and upon writing this heart-wrenching confession of wrongdoing to her. And i tell you what, this is a history with the bark on. This is Will in an extant letter to his fiancée, Betty. I have lived a lie, and now I am reaping the harvest of it. Please make a little allowance for me, dear. I am scared and don't know what to do. Betty, this is all what comes of doing wrong. I'd done the greatest wrong that anyone could do. 
and I have wished and prayed a thousand times since that I have not done it. No, I am no man. I am the weakest child you ever saw. If you knew me better, I am easily led and can be pulled into almost anything. I have no mind of my own. I just drift and drift. God knows where, too. Now listen, don't you think of deserting me in all this. I need you. That's the end of his uh, letter there, seeking forgiveness from Betty. I'm happy to say, as we see in his later years, he, uh, he was a young man still in his 20s, a wild and rambling cowboy and roper, and he, he obviously learned from whatever those mistakes were. And he was smitten with Betty for sure. And fortunately, she apparently forgave him as she and Will produced four children, uh, one of whom, Fred, died of diphtheria while an infant. Will only ever spoke of the boy's death publicly twice and then indirectly, and he never uttered a word of it among family members. Will began composing a periodic telegram in the early 1920s, he would have been in his early 30s, that reported his doings with the unknown, and especially with the famous, but laced by his trademark modesty and humor. His ability to connect with Americans of every background catapulted this telegram into the most popular newspaper column in the nation, carried by over 500 publications, as well as one of radio's most popular nationally broadcast programs hosted by Will himself in that brand new medium. He also wrote frequently for the Saturday Evening Post, the famous weekly magazine. There he exhorted Americans to embody the frontier values from his Oklahoma upbringing of neighborliness and democracy at home while in the tradition of Washington and Jefferson steering clear of the foreign entanglements that the nation was increasingly pursuing especially, as Will knew, under his friend, President Franklin Roosevelt. Ironically, Will's written articles packing the most punch were not typically humorous. Much of the nation hung on his reports of the most momentous events of the generation. Two of the most famous concern his good friend Charles Lindbergh, America's greatest aviator. He wrote the first during the Lone Eagle's fabled cross-Atlantic flight and the second during the search for the beloved Lindbergh's kidnapped baby, whom Will had visited with just two weeks before and who was later found murdered. He also starred in 71 movies, Silent and Talking. Famed director John Ford's poignant tale of post-Civil War Kentucky, Judge Priest endures as perhaps Roger's finest film and performance. His title role in the film as a lonely widower, Confederate veteran, and kindly town judge provides a ghostly window into his own unique confluence of folksy wisdom elegiac wistfulness and nobleness of spirit. Put Judge Priest down as a thoroughly delightful, sentimental comedy, wrote the New York Times, and let it remind you that Will Rogers, although he bears the burdens of the nation on his shoulders, continues to be a remarkably heartwarming personality. Well, by the end of his life, Will was America's top-ranked motion picture box office champion. And late in his own life, meanwhile, Director John Ford, who won more Academy Awards for Best Director than anyone else, named Judge Priest as the film he most loved of any he ever made. Will Rogers, Oklahoma's favorite son. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the names we think we know. John J. Dwyer, Will Rogers. Well, Gwen, a lot of folks hear the name Will Rogers and think he was a funny guy, but few of us really know some of the funny things he says. He said the best doctor in the world is the veterinarian. He can't ask his patients what is the matter. He's just got to know. (laughs) Good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. When the Okies left Oklahoma, you like this one, and moved to California, it raised the IQ of both states. The only time people dislike gossip is when you gossip about them. No man is great if he thinks he is. We lost thousands of lives and spent billions of dollars in World War I, and you could hand a sheet of paper to one million different people and tell them to write down what that war was for, And the only answer that would be alike would be, darned if I know. And then, of course, 
I joked about every prominent man in my time, but I never met a man I didn't like. Well, Will's politics indeed defy cataloging. Critics have accused him of being everything from a millionaire who was no friend of the working man to a racist. His own words and friendships shred most such accusations. He championed the plight of the downtrodden, consistently called upon those with resources to aid the less fortunate, and did so himself, publicly scolded the head of U.S. Steel for opposing the eight-hour workday, and barnstormed for 50 days through drought-ravaged Oklahoma and other southwestern states during the Dust Bowl. The New York Times compared Will Rogers' drought relief efforts and tour to St. Francis of Assisi. It praised him for, quote, flying over great stretches of God's earth to make it as much of heaven as possible while still being a very human mortal, end quote. Gentle defender of the needy and other underdogs versus the powerful people and institutions of his time, he had decried the suffering of Oklahomans and other Americans as the Great Depression unfolded. By the time of his death, however, he openly questioned the dramatic shift of power toward the federal government. The final day of 1934, less than two years into his friend Roosevelt's New Deal administration, Will said, quote, Well, the old year will be passing out in a few hours, and I don't know personally a thing I can do about it. I guess there will be a lot of people will take it up with the government as they look to them to do everything else, end quote. Perhaps Will embodied the views of what we might consider today a moderately conservative capitalist with a compassion for the needy, high expectations of the affluent, and proponent of a modest, though wise, role for the government. Yet socialist, if not communist, fellow Oklahoman Woody Guthrie said he had two heroes, and this might surprise you, Jesus Christ and Will Rogers. Well, though regularly practicing most of the tenets of Orthodox Christianity, Will himself did not espouse a belief in that faith, despite his Methodist Church South upbringing and his mother's hopes that he would become a preacher. She died when he was 10, but he fondly recalled singing the Methodist hymns of his childhood church with her. She brought the first piano into their part of the Cherokee country, present-day Rogers County. Biographer Yagoda suggests that, quote, to the extent that he had a general view of the world, it was nihilistic, stark, and rather cold, end quote. Will's own words to famous historian Will Durant offer gloomy support of this estimate. Quoting Will now, What all of us know put together don't mean anything. Nothing don't mean anything. We're just here a spell and pass on. End quote. But not a regular churchgoer as an adult in Beverly Hills, California, he nonetheless required his children to attend every week. He helped raise money to build the community's first church, Beverly Hills Community Church, which still operates. The end came for Will on August 15, 1935, in the infamous Alaskan plane crash that killed him and his close friend, famous pilot Wiley Post. Will's daughter Mary had just appeared in the play Ceiling Zero as a girl whose father died in a plane crash. The Eskimos who found the famed Oklahoman's bodies described Will as a big man with boots. So why such colossal and enduring popularity for Will Rogers no doubt many factors contributed, but few perhaps as strongly as his possession of a quality as rare as it is beloved, a great and famous man whom common folks recognized truly liked them and considered them as good as himself. And I close with another quote from biographer Yogoda, who summarized it well. When Will Rogers became first a show business and subsequently a national figure, the element of his persona that was most striking and it could be argued did the most to bring about his enormous popularity was his profound modesty. It permeated everything he did, his habit of staring at the floor on stage and in the movies, only occasionally lifting a shy gaze, the kinders and sorters with which he modified nearly every declarative sentence he spoke or wrote, his absolute refusal in the millions of words he spoke and wrote to bring any glory upon himself, end quote. We loved him then, Gwen, and we love him still. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. <laughs>